it's my big pleasure uh, to introduce our first uh, speaker. It's Professor Colonel Stephen Hamilton, KJ5HY, Chief of Staff and Technical Director of the Army Cyber Institute, Professor at the United States uh, Military Academy at West Point, and we're so happy to have uh, Colonel Hamilton here. Uh, his uh, title of his talk is the HF Resonance in the U.S. Army. Uh, it's all yours, Colonel Hamilton, and uh, we, we love your uniform. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite an honor to be here um, amidst some, some real giants in the field. Uh, it, this is, uh, it's just, it's kind of humbling to me. Uh, and when I talk about giants, I'm actually just talking about the towers at Tim's house and Frank's house. I don't know if anybody's driven by there or seen them on Google Maps, but they got some impressive setups. Um, no, but in all seriousness, this is a, it's a, a it's, it's really an honor. It's a, um, uh, it's a wonderful program that, that uh, you put together, Jim. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk about um, this topic, uh, mainly because, you know, I joined the Army. Uh, I graduated from West Point in 1998. Uh, and uh, I, I was a ham operator in high school and, and middle school. And when I... Um, uh, decided on what branch I wanted to go. I, there's this branch called Signal Corps uh, back in the day. And so I, um, uh, I, I, as a computer science major, I had various officers tell me various things about how to choose a branch and what's important. But I think uh, what, what uh, drew me to Signal was because uh, at one point someone said, you know, if you really like communications, then, then you want to do that. Um, and so I, th I thought about it and I was like, you know, I already know Morse code because I, back in the day you had to learn Morse code for your general class license. And, and uh, so uh, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just do that. And then I'll already, I'll already be a leg up when I get there. And, and uh, oddly enough, the, the army equipment, as you'll see in my presentation is uh, it's, it's kind of uh, what, I, what I'll use the term soldier proof is what we use, uh, which is basically it's, 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 you don't put a lot of thought into the radio side. You just turn it on and you make it work uh, based on the instructions you're given. So uh, I remember at one of the first exercises, I was just, we, they were saying that they were having trouble. And I said, well, I was like, what's the SWR on your antenna? And they looked at me like I, I had a, a third eye or something. They, they were just like totally confused. And um, it's, it's ironic now that all the, all of the things that kind of uh, went away with HF when I was just you know starting out in the army are starting to come back, and that's what my talk is about today: um, high frequency renaissance in the United States Army. So, with that, I think is my screen. I think it's sharing. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's uh, sharing. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, uh, I you know I I don't know. Um, I, it would have been great to have done this in person by, you know, I don't know the, the, uh, the, there's probably varying levels of what people know about HF in the audience. I'm sure that there's plenty of people here that know more, way more about it than I am, uh, than I do. Um, as as uh, Jim said, I'm a, a computer science professor in, in the electrical engineering computer science department, and that's, that's my uh, training. So um, a lot of people in the department uh, uh, keep thinking that I'm an electrical engineer and it's because usually electrical engineers are, are the ones that are the experts in, in, uh, in the RF field. So, um, so why am I talking about it? Um, it's mainly because of uh, what we were discussing just before this program started. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I started out as Signal, but I, I switched over to Cyber and uh, the new Cyber branch stood up just a few years ago. And uh, as a computer scientist and as a you know, uh, Signal officer, uh, cyber seemed to be a natural fit to kind of slide into, and, and I'm at the Army Cyber Institute, and um, we, we're thinking about like future problems. And, and you know, over the last 20 years, we have been um, relying in the Army so much on satellite for everything, and we've been fighting a, an adversary that um, doesn't really have much capability to jam our satellites, doesn't even understand it. Um, but if we look at a future threat of uh, our, our um, what we call near peer adversaries. Um, uh, China and Russia, they have capabilities, they have electronic warfare capabilities and, and knocking out a satellite, um, either as we just saw with, with Russia shooting them down physically or, or with, um, with using uh, electronic warfare means uh, jamming is, is really not that difficult because uh, 
it, there's really not a lot of power. If you think about a satellite trying to transmit back down, it doesn't. It only has so much power it can it can transmit, and so the signal that comes back is fairly weak. So it's not hard to to knock someone off. Uh, so the question becomes, what did the Army do before um, before satellite comms? And we did we did HF. That's what we did, and uh, it was a slightly before my time. I think I did learn a little bit about HF when I first joined the Army, but it was it was kind of not. Um, you know, after 9-11, everything, um, we, we focused on counterterrorism and everything kind of changed after that. So um, thinking about uh, long-haul uh, long comms, and, and I'll, I'll use the term beyond the line of sight, that's really what, we, what we're talking about here. Um, there's only, uh, without a satellite, there's really only one way to do it. Um, we, could, we could debate over troposcatter, which is another method of, of going beyond the line of sight, but it requires a lot of power. Um, but basically, HF is what we used prior to that. Um, so what is HF? Just a quick background. I know plenty of you have probably seen this chart and understand it, but I, 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 as I look at this, um, I, I'd like to just point out that there's just, the electromagnetic spectrum has some special properties depending on where you're at in it. So um, if you look in the center, you see uh, a center left, you see visible light. So um, that, that part of the electromagnetic spectrum is super critical for us to see. It's, it's, it's what we see around us. It's the light that we see. Um, if you go to the right, you see where HF is, and HF is this only part of the spectrum uh, that does it, that has this weird property that uh, Marconi was um, not quite understanding and trying to figure out was the the idea that it that it bounces off the ionosphere. So um, that that unique property is what allows us to do this beyond the line of sight communication. So <clears throat> um, this is a, another. I like pictures, so uh, this helps kind of just describe the ionosphere is way up there. Uh, F1, F2 layer, and between three and 30 megahertz, you, when you transmit, you can get it, um, you could get it to refract back down, which can take you over a mountaintop or over a, uh, um, a building or a, a town, um, depending on, you know, what, what your location is. And so um, uh, this, this is, uh, this, this property is really the, the critical piece because it's not like a satellite that you can jam, it's, it's the ionosphere, it's a, it's a property of the, um, of our atmosphere. So, um, a quick history here uh, on HF radio. So uh, some of you are hams and see your normal um, uh, Kenwoods and ICOMs, and I think that there looked like there was a giveaway for an ICOM at the beginning here uh, they're talking about. So um, those, those radios, I love, you know, as a ham operator, I love operating those radios. But when I pick up one of these, I always get immediately frustrated because they're, they're very confining. You don't just kind of surf around the, the, the band and try to find a frequency and then and then uh, listen for a contest station or something like that. Uh, these radios are, are uh, what I would call um, soldier proof, as I said earlier, uh, because they're generally programmed one way and then they're tried, they try to make it where the soldier just has to press the talk and then it, and then it works. And so um, the real key uh, protocol that makes this happen is ALE, which is automatic link establishment. Um, we've actually got it at the Army Cyber, Cyber Institute. We've got all three of these radios, which I'm pretty excited about. We just recently got the 160 within the last year, and um, which is the bottom one. Um, so the 138 was um, uh, quite old. I think in the 80s uh, we had that radio, and then the 150 is what's most common, I think, fielded right now, um, which does 2G and 3G ALE, um, and not to be confused with the the 3G uh, cell phone. It's just a generation. So the, the, the second generation, third generation of, of automatic link establishment. Um, and then the, uh, the PRC-160, which is the, the newest one, a little bit smaller. Um, and uh, it, it actually interfaces quite well with the computer. The 150 had a lot more difficulty in doing that. Um, and, and all of these do ALE. And so um, what am I talking about when I talk about ALE? So People get confused about this. Sometimes they think that we're doing frequency hopping. Um, with HF, we're, we really don't do a lot of frequency hopping. In VHF, we absolutely do that, um, which is good for, um, it, it, gives a, it gives some jam resistance when you frequency hop. But really what we're talking about with ALE is um, uh, just a, 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 I hate to call it this, but it's kind of like a brute force way of, of um, establishing a link. So um, the, the two hurdles when you're establishing HF that you always have is uh, frequency selection and, uh, and of course the antenna type and the, and the height of it. Um, so what ALE does is it solves this first part because instead of going in and, and well, ham operators probably just listen and they hear a station and, and maybe get on a DX cluster and say, oh, wow, this is, uh, you know, I'm, re I'm receiving this, so, so this is where we're able to talk to. 
um, it, or sometimes you'll you'll go on. There's the VOA cap, and and I've gone on plenty of times to say, okay, what would be the best frequency to operate at this time of day? Um, and and it takes a while. It's not very user friendly, but you can figure it out. And you could say, okay, here's the here's the ideal frequency for what we're doing. And and, and I've done this in in some of our um, testing that we've done that I'll that I'll show later in the presentation. But um, uh, what what you could do with ALE is you could just pre-program in uh, all uh, frequencies across the HF spectrum. And then what it'll do is it'll do the sounding and it'll figure out, um, uh, it'll try to connect to the other radio or the, the, the base station and basically give a link quality assessment across each frequency. Then once that's completed, then you could just hit uh, best call and it'll automatically choose the frequency. And the soldier actually just sees channel number. They don't even see um, what frequency they're talking on. So they, they just see that it works. And, uh, and that's really key because if you think about um, you know, a spectrum manager, there's going to be specialized people that are going to have to understand the HF spectrum. But if you think about a soldier in the field that's just trying to make comms for the commander, the, you know, they, they don't, they're going to be stressed out with a lot of other things. And so you need it to work um, very quickly and very well. And, and that's what, um, that's what ALE does. Um, as you see, uh, this is, I kind of created this uh, diagram at the bottom. I, I like it because um, it, it helps visualize what's happening when you when you choose these frequencies. So the top frequency is the 21 megahertz, and you see that kind of shooting off with the orange. It's a little bit small, but shooting off through the ionosphere because as you go up in frequency, you're likely to penetrate the ionosphere um, as you use like VHF and UHF with satellites. You don't want it to be absorbed or, or refracted. Um, when you hit the sweet spot frequency, then that one comes back down, which in, in this case I have listed as just, these are just frequencies I've just made up here, uh, 5.25. And then as you go too low in frequency, then you could possibly just get absorbed completely. So um, it's really critical. I'm going to mostly be talking about uh, NIVIS communication, um, which is near vertical incident skywave, where you're really, you, you, you need all the ionosphere bouncing you can get because you're going to be going up at a very uh, steep angle and coming right back down. <clears throat> okay, so um, antenna types. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think... Um, uh, Frank could probably give a better presentation on antennas here with with his uh, incredible setup. I was able to my my uh, I used to live in Maryland and my sons live or my sons were in uh, I, I went to a soccer uh, uh, place that must be nearby his house and I remember the first time I saw it I was like holy cow um, what what is going on over here um, but uh, he's got a lot of neat towers which you see on the far right with the with the yagi. Um, those aren't technically field expedient. Um, in the Army, we have to sometimes set up in a very um, a short time, get something ready to go and, and communicate and then move on. Um, for, for NIVIS communication, we're typically looking at a dipole or inverted V, most likely inverted V because it's just the easiest to set up. Um, but uh, there has been a, uh, some research, and if anybody uh, knew Dave, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Dave Fiedler, he was a big HF proponent. Um, just before my time, I think he retired probably when I was being commissioned. Um, and uh, he's the one that devised this idea of saying, well, if you want to do NIVIS communication, uh, you could just take a whip on a Humvee and you can tie it down because now you have, uh, you have it uh, parallel with the, with the skyline, which is what you need to, to get that angle um, to be so steep to go up to, the, uh, to do a NIVIS communication. So um, it's, it's really, really critical. And I think this is the part of the HF Renaissance that, that we're, we're finally getting to because for the last 20 years, all the, the Army does is like, well, just put, a, put an antenna on it and start transmitting. For VHF, that works for you know vertical antenna, you're ready to go. But actually putting some thought into where am I trying to communicate to? How should I set my antenna so that it gets the maximum power there? That, that is really like an essential piece um, that, we, that we have to train on. It's not something that you're just, you're gonna be able to uh, push an easy button on for sure. Okay, um, this is the part that's super exciting to me is, is uh, you know, as a computer scientist, I love the digital aspects of this, uh, of, of radio in general. Um, and uh, the, uh, when we go back to the, the early times, you have uh, what we, uh, my, my old NCOs used to call it the rat rigs. You had these uh, radio teletype, which was back in the, the, the 20s. Um, and that was... Uh, Obviously, the Navy, they rely probably more on HF than the Army does uh, for, for long-haul communication. Um, and then, um, really, you, you didn't see, you started to see in the 70s, uh, AX25, which uh, came from the X25 protocol. Um, I think it's amateur X25. 
And, uh, and that was packet radio. That was my first introduction into uh, digital radio. I got this little Baypack modem and had an old computer that uh, I was able to, to connect to um, DX clusters and some, and some BBSs or, or um, bulletin uh, places back in, back when I lived in Texas. That's why I have the five call, by the way. Um, so uh, uh, that, was a, that was really cool. And then Bob Berninga actually kept that alive by uh, creating the APRS network uh, after that which is still like widely, very widely used today. Um, then uh, in, in the, about the time I was graduating from West Point, Phase Shift King came out. I didn't have an HF radio at the time, so I wasn't quite into this at the time. I, I definitely got into it later on. Uh, PSK is a really cool uh, protocol, but if anybody's ever operated it, they'll probably realize that um, it has no error correction. So you definitely get some weird things that happen uh, with, uh, with PSK, uh, PSK 31. Uh, you, you'll, you'll start to see a sentence and then it'll kind of get garbled sometimes and then it'll come back again. And that's just the fading that happens on HF. Um, so if we look at the military side of things, we have the ALE uh, uses uh, MFSK uh, frequency shift king. So uh, the 2G standard was in uh, 99 and the 3G standard was in uh, 2011. So um, that's, that's kind of a critical thing to think about when, when I hear people say, oh, HF is like old, uh, old war, uh, old school comms, um, uh, cold war comms is what, it, is what a lot of people refer to it as. And, um, it, you know, yes, it was used in the cold war, but it doesn't mean HF is cold war comms. Uh, you know, this, this standard, this 3JLE, if, if anybody here's operated it, we've, um, I, I know that there's some, a few people here that are probably Mars operators and, and uh, we got a chance to, do, to operate that in uh, Noble Skywave this past year. And, uh, Really, what's cool about uh, the the 3G standard is is it's got it's got all these other modes. So you, once you make a link to a station, you could say, oh, I'm just going to do digital, or I'm going to do digital voice, or maybe it's it's a it's a rough link, and I'm going to go to a um, a low a low data rate digital voice, which maybe sounds a little more digitized, but it'll still work. Um, one one thing I think is kind of fun to play with too. Um, if you ever get a chance to to uh, operate it 3G ALE on a, on a Harris radio is there's a thing called LDV, which is last ditch voice. So basically if you really can't make the contact, but you need to send a message, you can still, um, basically it records your voice and it sends it almost like a voicemail. So it'll, it'll sit there and slowly over a very low data rate, send it across. And then once it's received, then it'll play it back for the other user. Um, so, uh, so those the advances in the military and obviously the most recent advances and I got the privilege to listen to uh, Joe Taylor speak at our local um, uh, ARL awards regional awards this past uh, actually last week so it's been it's been a great week uh, and uh, he created the uh, JT65 and then eventually what, what caught on fire was uh, FT8 um, in 2017 that got released and now if anybody here ever turns to 14074 7074 you hear um, that the whole thing is just crowded with FT8 stations, just making a lot of contacts. It's a really, really cool mode. Um, so I, I like to present that as just, just to show that, um, and, and I do this in, in, in our army meetings as well, saying, hey, you know, there's still advances being made. Um, the ionosphere hasn't changed. The, the computers have gotten much better and the di digital encodings have just gotten to be amazing. So, uh, uh, so that 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 part I think is 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 critical for people to understand that that we're moving forward in in, in HF. It's not something that's kind of stagnated. And uh, the next the next thing I want to talk about is um, the the back end of things. I, I remember you know the, the internet started becoming a big thing uh, ar around the time I I uh, started my military career, and in it. The question became, you know, what's the purpose of HF when you could just now do a voice for IP? I mean, look at us right now. We're all talking over the internet, um, all in different places across the U.S. You know, what's the what's going to happen to HF then? And um, I would like to point out that the internet actually can help. And this this is the the, the part that's just super fascinating. Um, the internet can help ham radio now because now we can record and we can also locate um, where signals are going to. So. Um, if anybody hasn't done this before, uh, this is the other part of FT8 that's super fun. If you think you have an antenna problem or a power problem and, you, and you're not making any contacts, you can always go to the uh, pskreporter.info and you can see if your signal is being received. In this case, um, all of these stations are, are stations that receive my signal either from when I uh, 
from when this screenshot was taken, either two hours ago or 27 minutes ago. So each one of those minutes is when it when they when that station last heard me, and they reported it to the reverse beacon network. So that to me is just another fascinating aspect of just uh, collaborating these these two means, the internet and HF, to be able to determine you know what's going on. Um, it, it's it's a super fun thing if you want to really play with your antenna to to make a transmission, make a modification to your your antenna. Now you can go back and see. What did that do? What what different stations received me now? So um, what what a great tool, like great instant feedback, not just kind of hoping for the best and hoping you're making your transmission. You can now see what your antenna is actually doing and how well it's performing. Um, the, the next thing I have to say is uh, the bandwidth issue. So um, one of the reasons why, you know, if HF had super, super high speed bandwidth, um, I don't know if we would be so concerned about doing satellites because uh, uh, satellites do provide the bandwidth, uh, but but HF can't provide that. So we have to acknowledge that is the fact that there's you could you could do some data, but you're really looking at um, digital voice. Uh, you could do like email. Um, I know some of you probably probably have done WinLink before. I've got a chance to play with that, which is super super cool. Um, so with that, um, it's important for us to not just uh, make sure that our soldiers are trained on how to operate HF and how to set up an HF radio, but we've got to also train our commanders. We have to take tell our commanders, look, when, when, the, when your satellite is cyber attacked and you can no longer communicate, there are other means to communicate, but you're going to have to think about the way you're going to communicate. Do you really need to do a VTC with the general um, to, to see his head, talking uh, head on there? You, you really don't. What you need, though, is you may need to say, you know, do we take this hill or not? Or are my units at this location? Um, there's very small amount of data that could be critically important in a battle, and that can still be passed over uh, HF. So it's important for us to be able to know when uh, we, we, ha we have an acronym called PACE. So it's primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. HF generally falls in that contingency emergency. But when you go to, when you operate your PACE plan, you say, okay, now we're in emergency comms, you also have to change the way you command and control. At that point, you have to realize you're not sending, you know, PowerPoints. You're going to be sending just text across. So a little bit of training that we have to do on our end to be able to um, uh, to explain that to commanders. Now, that being said, there is uh, one example I have that's super cool um, that we've done some testing with, which is uh, what if we tried to just abstract away the, uh, the, the HF link completely? And so we did this uh, um, this this use case with uh, John Rosica from uh, Nivis Communications and Graham Kyle, and and what they did is they used a codan radio which does do a three G three G AOE, and <clears throat> they had uh, this thing called the Android Tactical Assault Kit. So one of the very important things that that the Army has to know is where are my units, and we call it the Blue Force. So where uh, you'll hear the, probably the term Blue Force Tracker. So uh, where are my units at right now? And um, if their satellite goes down, then they need to do probably VHF. If they can't do that, then they need to do um, HF. Now to abstract away that HF backbone, um, what they did is they showed an example of all of this is passed over this uh, cell phone, over this Android tactical assault kit, um, using either uh, Wi-Fi, a local access point um, uh, that, that connects to, or, or actual cell service. And uh, as, that's, um, as those, units and stuff are moved, if, if there's a backbone that's, that's uh, the internet or, or some other high-speed uh, uh, satellite link, if that, gets, if that goes down and we have HF to fall back on, if think about what the data has to be transferred. It doesn't have to be this map. The map's already loaded on the phone. What has to be transferred is where's that blue dot? Where are my units at? And so sending over just a unit designator and a grid coordinate is uh, is perfectly uh, a, a perfect example of HF being able to do that. That is um, that's very very easy to do because it's just a small amount of data, um, but it gives that visual picture at the end, and the user doesn't even have to know that we just switched to HF on the back end. So um, this this is where I think we're going to be going as far as employing HF and making it seamless and easy to use uh, for the military. Okay. Um, I, I've already mentioned this a couple times, and I did take this from Ben Whitley. If you ever really, really want to know HF, he just did his PhD in, in, uh, in uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Nevis communication, 
he did his PhD in Nevis communication. It's um, I haven't gotten through the whole thing yet, but it's he's got. Uh, I did get a chance to talk with him uh, at one point, and uh, what a fascinating uh, individual who's done some remarkable work and really understanding how to do uh, Nivis communication. And so the next part of my talk here is just I'm going to talk about some examples that we've done because, it, like I said before, if you think about it like a brigade combat team that's out on the in, in, out in the um, in an area where there's there's obstacles in, in the way, their VHF comms aren't gonna cover their whole footprint. Um, they're gonna need to use either satellite or Nevis uh, communication. So um, it was uh, discovered in the 1920s, was a, the propagation was discovered during World War II as an essential means to establish communications in large war zones, such as the D-Day invasion in Normandy. So uh, this, is, this isn't something new. Um, and, and I've actually had people when I've given this talk uh, or talked about Nivis before, I've had ham radio operators say, well, what kind of specialized antenna do you need? And it's, you know, a dipole is not really a special antenna, but uh, a dipole can do that. And in this example, you can see the dipole is just transmitting straight up and then coming right back down. Um, one misconception or myth of, of Nivis uh, is people talk about skip zones. In Nivis, there's not really a skip zone. And uh, and I know I, you know, when I've when I've gone down to Penn State with with Jim and 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 Dr. Uh, Keith Lisiak, who who I worked with, uh, I think he he recently retired. Um, he was set, setting up these ionospans, uh, which is a way to measure uh, where the ionosphere is refracting your signal. Um, very fascinating piece of equipment, um, but but it 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 breaks that myth that people say that there's this skip zone in Nivis. There's no skip. You can go zero to six hundred miles. Um, you can go fifteen miles. You can go five miles. In the case of the ionosan, you're going at a 90 degree angle straight up to the ionosphere and right back down. So there's absolutely no skip and, and, and there's no uh, missed coverage in Nivis uh, propagation. Um, okay, so um, what did we do uh, at Army Cyber Institute? We said, well, what happens when our satellites go down? Let's go to the, the place that we think is the most uh, uh, accurate example of a deployment. If anybody is from California, you probably know or you've heard of uh, the National Training Center at Fort Irwin. And um, I would say after being deployed to Iraq, this is probably the closest uh, to the, the way I felt in Iraq when I got, when I got out there. You feel quite remote when you're in this, uh, this desert. Um, in uh, the, the great part of this desert, it has this terrain feature called the Tifert Mountain, um, which this mountain pr prohibits you to do VHF across it. And we actually brought our VHF radios and did some uh, testing just to verify that we could not talk VHF comms across this mountain. Um, so we went out there and we actually used uh, commercial radios. So we got a buddy pole and, and uh, Elecraft with, uh, with an amplifier and, um, and basically just did what, you know, what's the, um, what can we do with, with Nivis and, and what's, the, what's the possibility? What is the, what is the uh, um, data rates? What, what, can we, what can we make work uh, in, in this field exercise? So um, the places we set up was... Um, I was at transceiver one, which is, it's a little bit hard to read. It's at the top of the um, uh, map here. And at the bottom are two different positions. So we went to two different places just to test this out. And um, what we did is we first started out with um, uh, voice communication. So we started at hundred Watts. Um, we made voice comms. We saw that the VHF comms didn't work. Um, then we went down to uh, 50 Watts and we were able to make 50 Watts work. And um, as hams are supposed to do, and they don't always do this, is you're supposed to use just the power that you, that's necessary. Usually people flip on their amp if they have it anyway. But uh, we were actually interested in how low of power can we go? Because if we have an adversary who's looking for us, we want to have short uh, transmissions. We want to have small transmissions. We want to have low power transmissions because we don't want to be direction. We don't want someone to direction find us. So our goal at this point was how can we go down to a very, very low power and make this work? And uh, so we, um, after 50 watts, we were able to go down to uh, 25 watts and, and voice kind of worked, but it wasn't that great. So at that point, we switched to our digital modes. And as I showed you earlier, we were, um, if you look at FT8, that was my first one to choose because I was like, we've uh, already tested this and it works really well. Let's see, let's see what we can do with it. We actually ended up using JS8 at the time because we want to send actual messages. So um, we did some JS8 and uh, we were able to bring it down to five watts, then one watt, 500 milliwatts. And then at this point, I kind of lost my mind, but we went down to 100 milliwatts and we were able to still close the link and send messages using JS8. 
that truly blew my mind. I mean, think about 100 milliwatts. That is a very, very low power uh, to be able to go um, this distance. And, and you look at this distance and it's like, well, um, you're not really going that far. We're going 21 kilometers. Well, let me put this in perspective for you. If you uh, were to map this, uh, and I put this into Google Earth, um, you see this, uh, the transceiver on the left, the takeoff angle is on the left there, uh, and the green in the center, I'll show you in this next slide, is actually um, uh, below the line of where the transmission was. So uh, this isn't an actual mathematical model. This is basic, this, all, all I did here was just put where the transceivers were, where the ionosphere is, and where you were um, uh, coming back down to. So this takeoff angle is about 85 degrees. It goes straight up the ionosphere. This is quite the distance. And then um, back down to the, the second transceiver. So 100 milliwatts to go that distance is very, very impressive. Um, I, I was kind of blown away by this. Um, I will say that in my disbelief, uh, I, you know, sometimes you, you get on the radio and it's kind of magical. You hear someone, you know, if I get on the radio here and I hear someone from New Jersey with all the mountains here in New York, I'm pretty sure I'm doing a pretty decent Nivis uh, shot there. There's no ground wave that's going to get me there. Um, but, I'm, but I'm only guessing, right? So to, to go further with this, we have this system called the Watchdog. And the Watchdog allowed us to do direction finding on the HF signal itself. So what we did is um, set this system up. It has four, uh, four Nivis antennas arranged in a certain way. And it'll tell you the two cool things. One is the direction of, of arrival, which is important, the, the line of bearing. But it'll also give us the elevation of arrival. And, and, and as I said before, how did I know I was really at 85 degrees? Well, this actually told us in, in, in the top screen here. It's not the best, um, it's not the best graphical interface, but it's it's really cool what it does. But it's sitting here at 85.8 degrees uh, was the elevation uh, coming down from, from the signal. So with that knowledge and with if you know where the refraction point is on the ionosphere, you can actually pinpoint where a station is transmitting from. And that's what we did here. Um, super, super cool because now it just confirmed that we were definitely doing a Nivis communication. There was no, no knife edge diffraction or something crazy happening that was allowing us to get over that mountain. We were truly sending the signal straight up in the air and straight back down. Um, interestingly enough, we couldn't get the watchdog to uh, DF when we went down to 100 milliwatts. It was just too much in the weeds. So that was a, that was a, interesting data point that we had. Okay, um, I did mention earlier about Noble Skywave, pretty cool exercise. I, and I mentioned this um, at our uh, uh, ARL uh, meeting last week, is uh, one thing that, and I know there's a, there's a youth talk uh, later today, but one thing that they have done with this Noble Skywave Mars exercise, and I really think that ARL and, and the HAM community should probably look at this as well, is, um, gamifying HF communication. So they have a thing that's kind of like a capture the flag where you have a live scoreboard on the internet. And as you make comms, you see yourself go up and down. What, what a cool way to get people excited about HF radio. Um, the thing that I was really excited about in this uh, particular one is the winner for zero to 150 watts was 10th Mountain Division, uh, which was Sergeant First Class Robert Snyder, which one of our guys actually just went and uh, um, delivered a watchdog to them up at Fort Drum. Uh, just this past week, uh, and um, very, very cool for a spectrum man uh, manager to be able to participate in this exercise and, and show, show his skills at, at operating all modes. It was um, a single sideband, uh, digital uh, voice, and 3G ALE, all, all of those different ones. So, Colonel, you have uh, two minutes, two minutes. Okay, great, perfect. Um, and it, it was just, it's just really fascinating. This is where I say the Renaissance is happening and, and uh, this is a perfect example of it. Um, we're doing some experimentation, but we're seeing active units that are actually out there um, doing some HF comms. And I, I will say that um, Noble Skywave, th this is, a, this is a, a contest to be emulated by the ham community too, because um, it is, it's really a fun exercise to operate on because it's not like you, you take your QSL, log because of the world, upload it and wait like six months to find out how, how well you did. Um, I think Frank doesn't have to worry about that because I think he always wins if I, <laughs> with his station there. But um, the, it, it's this, this exercise, I think it's just fascinating because even if you don't win, you can still kind of see where you're at and you can, you can kind of push yourself to, 
uh, to make more contacts and see where everybody else is at and, and, and you know, compete with, with, other, uh, with other stations on there. So very exciting. So um, I'll, leave with, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, HF requires training and practice. Uh, one of the things that 10th Mountain has done is they don't go to the field and just say, oh, let's, let's turn on our RHF radio and start transmitting. They actually practice in garrison. Um, uh, they, they'll set up a network and they practice before they go to the field so they know how to operate. They have their plans loaded in their, in their machines or in their uh, radios. And uh, it's just, uh, um, it, that's really the way you have to do it. It's just not as easy as VHF. There's, there's a little bit of thought you've got to put into it. Um, and uh, as I said, it's less bandwidth. So we got to figure out how to make sure the commanders understand that. And it's really the only alternative to SATCOM. And, and the bottom pictures here, I'm pretty proud of. Uh, Nolan, who's actually the, in the, uh, the cadet in the first, uh, the first cadet in the photo at the bottom there, um, he, he attended this uh, back when we did this in person uh, a couple years ago. Um, and he's one of our star operators here. Um, you see in the background, this is, the, this is our HF, or this is our uh, club room here. We have uh, the uh, PRC-150 is, is in the background there. Um, and you can see an old Heath kit off to the left. We have a little um, uh, antique station there with the Collins S line that people, people love to see that. And then on the left is, the, uh, is our antenna setup. So we have the satellite array on the right and then a, um, a JK mid tri 40 on the left. Um, it's, uh, we recently just put this up. Uh, we, there was a big building renovation. They had to take down our antennas from before. So we rebuilt uh, pretty much from scratch. And uh, I'm real excited because we have a pretty much a state-of-the-art system. Uh, we recently got a flux radio with a, with a, uh, someone donated a power genius to us. So we, we have quite the, quite the setup. So when the cadets have time, they definitely have a, an amazing station to work on. And uh, with that, I think I'm about out of time. But I, I, Well, thank you very much, Colonel. That was a great presentation, a lot of interesting points. And uh, I wanna bring our uh, moderator, Barney Scholl on. And Barney, uh, a few questions for Colonel, please. Well, there were a, a lot of good comments in the uh, chat during the presentation. Actually, more comments than there were questions, but a uh, couple things that came up if we have time here. Is, the, is all of the communication in HF encrypted in one way, or could it be intercepted by someone? Oh, fantastic question. So... Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a two-part answer to that. First of all, if you if you do any Mars stuff, Mars actually does do encryption. Um, so if you, I know in ham radio, you're not allowed to do encryption, but um, uh, the Mars, if you want to do as a civilian, you can do encryption. For the military, um, the Noble Skywave, I, we did not do encryption. It was, it was hard enough just to set the network up. Uh, when we do actual military comms, we absolutely encrypt. Uh, there's a there's a full encryption. I think I think it's AES two fifty six. Um, th there's what's called a fill. So you'll load your, your radio with a fill, which has your comsec in it, and there's rotating keys. And so uh, absolutely there's encryption. Now, I, I will say I'm not, I don't believe we have key distribution. We have an actual comsec, like uh, comsec custodian, there's a key distribution. So it's all symmetric keys uh, that, that we have control over that we rotate. Um, usually monthly is our key changeover. But great question. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, another question, Barney. Yeah, I was wondering, actually myself, any of the modes that you're using, the digital modes especially, are, are they unique to the military or are those modes that are either currently in use by amateurs or could be in use by amateurs? Yeah, so I'm going to tell you, and, and again, this is, I, I probably should have started with the disclaimer that the thoughts are my own and not representative of the U.S. Army and the Army Cyber Institute, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little frustrated with Harris on this one. Um, if you take a Harris radio and a Kodan radio, and they both say that they talk the 3GALE standard, they can't talk to each other. Um, so the digital modes that, that are employed, uh, the, the, spec the NATO specification is not good enough to, to get to all of the details about how uh, the communication is made. So um, it, it, it is um, quite proprietary. Uh, so for 3GALE, uh, no, it's not something a ham's probably gonna do. Uh, 2G, I think WinLink uses some version of ALE. Um, uh, I, I would say the 2G is what the Mars operators use that are ham operators. And um, that, that, is, uh, that is shared among the Mars operators. So there are some modes there, but as far as the TAC chat and, and the proprietary 
pieces of this. It is, um, uh, it, it, that's a, it, it's frustrating, uh, but no, it, it, I don't, I don't have any mood that I, now I will say we've done a little bit of research with SDRs to try to try to backward um, reverse engineer what, what they're actually doing. Um, but other than reading, you can, you can go and read on, on, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's to, it's a Stenag 5040. It's a there's a NATO standard for 3GALE, and you can read that, and it'll kind of give you some general things. But I think it's 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 a form of frequency shift keying that they use. Barney, go ahead. Uh, how long does it take LE to find the best frequency? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it it depends on a, a couple of variables. If you have GPS timing and you have a time of day server, I, I learned and I just learned this recently in Noble Skywave that you don't have to have your timing perfect. If you have a small amount of frequencies, it'll eventually negotiate. Um, but generally, you have a time of day server, and that means everybody's hopping at the same time on all the same frequencies. So it's it, it's about. Um, I would say like five to 10 seconds per frequency for it to, to, to do the assessment. Um, and then once it's done with the assessment, you'll have a, a link assessment for every single frequency that you have. You can load up, depending on the, the radio, the 150 can load up to about, I think, 30 stations or so. And the 160 can do like 100 um, uh, different stations that, that go into a net. You have to build like a comm plan. You put the net in and you also put the frequencies and the frequencies can either be like two frequencies or it can be, you know, 20, I think you can go 15 or 20 frequencies. And um, the more frequencies you have, obviously the longer it'll take because it'll have to cycle through each one. Are there, situ are there situations where they won't lock up at all? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, there's times when I've seen it where only one frequency works, and, and then when you do a best call, it'll just go to that frequency, and it just won't work on the other ones. Yep. Uh, another question popped up a little bit different direction. Are is the equipment hardened hardened against uh, any um, atmospheric conditions, Mag like magnetic pulses? You know, I would hope so for the amount of money we spend on these things. I, I, I don't know. I haven't taken one apart, um, but they are definitely, the Harris radios are ruggedized. You could probably drop this thing. And and I, I don't know as far as the inside. I don't believe that uses vacuum tubes, if you're asking that question, but it is enclosed um, in such a in such a way that I, I think it should be able to handle somewhat. But I don't, that's a great question. I really don't know how big of a pulse would take to, to blow it out. But, but I will say it, it uses, um, because of the digital modes, it's, it's got transistors in there. And so at some level, I think you, you probably could break it, but, I'm, but I would bet that it would take a lot. You, you mentioned tubes. The question came across, of, are the Russians still using tubes? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, we, still, we still use tubes. I think our, I, you know, I haven't taken apart our, um, our, uh, we do have the, we just recently got the 160 uh, kilowatt amplifier, and I believe there's tubes in it. I haven't taken it apart yet, but if I do, I will let everybody know. I'll take a picture of it, but I'm pretty sure it's got a tube in it because usually when you start getting those, those higher powers, it's, it's, uh, the tubes can handle a lot more. There was a request to put your first, your, the, one of the early slides about ALE back on again, if you could. Okay, I can do that. Uh, uh, which one? I'm not sure which one it was. Let me uh, give me a second here. Share screen. Okay, this is one of them. And then the other one that I put was this one. That may have been the one. Yeah, if anybody's interested in actually doing ALE, I, like I said, I think I think Winlink. If I if I were to guess, Winlink is some version of ALE. It might be like two G ALE. I'm, I'm not sure, or it might be just one the, the original ALE. But if you ever operate Winlink, it's very very similar to to what what we see with the military three G ALE. All right, Colonel. Um, thank you so much. Uh, great questions from the audience, and uh, we certainly uh, like the uh, audience participation. Colonel, if somebody had a 
question that didn't get answered today or they think of something, is there an email address that they can use to get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can put it in the chat, but uh, just Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Hamilton at westpoint.edu. Um, that's my work address and it'll, it'll get to me. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jim to uh, give his thanks and also introduce our next speaker. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Uh, one thing uh, with virtual, we we can applaud, but uh, I think we can show it on the uh, video here. So uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. And we all are applauding virtually uh, to your presentation. 